We are very pleased to have Damodha Prasad Prabhu with us, who will be speaking from the Bhagavad Gita as it is chapter four. And uh, we are continuing our uh, systematic study of this wonderful book, and we hope that uh, you will uh, be able to give us some interesting points, and maybe we can have questions and answers at the end of uh, your talk, maybe after, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes. Uh, those of you who are kind of camera shy or microphone shy, you may write your questions into the chat box uh, during the lecture or, yeah, uh, would be better if it's during the lecture, not just, uh, don't wait till the end because then we might be missing you if you are a slow typer. And those of you who want to ask spontaneously, you can ask your questions at the end of the lecture by unmuting yourselves. So the stage, so to say, is your Damoda Prasad Prabhu. Uh, and just a few words of introduction. He is, as you can see, uh, sort of brahmachari i guess <laughs> and he lives in zurich where he is also part of the harinam ashram he is has ample travel experience all over the world and he is also a an enthusiastic distributor of Srinath Prabhupada's books Hare Krishna Hare Krishna can you hear me Prabhu yes we can hear you very well okay so first of all I don't know you Prabhu you got some information about me. What is your name, Prabhu? My name is Karuna Shakti Das. I was given the task by Nika Shavanti and Jainitai Prabhu to uh, moderate this meeting and to introduce you. And they were okay. also the ones who gave me the info. Okay. Okay, Hare Krishna, Karuna Shakti Prabhu. Nice to meet you. And I want to first of all thank Jainitai Prabhu for inviting me to talk to you. and. As you have said, Karuna Shakti Prabhu, you said, you hope that I can say something which is of value, and I hope the same, that I can say something which will uh, be in accordance with what our Acharyas have said, and which will inspire us. So I will just go straight to the reading of the verse. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Should I just read the Sanskrit all by myself? Ja, aber jetzt bist du wieder auf Mute, oder man hört dich gar nicht mehr. Okay, can you hear me now? Ja. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so today we are reading from Bhagavad Gita as it is. Um, this is chapter number four, which is entitled Transcendental Knowledge. And we are reading text number 14. Namam karmani limpanti, name karma fale spriha, itimang yo bijanati, karma birna sabadyate. Word for word translation. Na, never. Mam, me. Karmani, all kinds of work. Limpanti, do effect. Na, nor. Me, my. Karma fale, in fruitive action. Spriha, aspiration. Iti, thus. Mam, me. Yaha, one who. Abhijanati, does know. Karma bihi, by the reaction of such work. Na, never. Saha, he. Badyate, becomes entangled. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, Shil Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. 
There is no work that affects me, nor do I aspire for the fruits of action. One who understands this truth about me also does not become entangled in the fruitive reactions of work. So we have a little longer purport, I hope. I guess you all have the book so you can read along. Purport, as there are constitutional laws in the material world stating that the king can do no wrong or that the king is not subject to the state laws. Similarly, the Lord, although he is the creator of this material world, is not affected by the activities of the material world. He creates and remains aloof from the creation, whereas the living entities are entangled in the fruitive results of material activities because of their propensity for lording it over material resources. The proprietor of an establishment is not responsible for the right and wrong activities of the workers, but the workers are themselves responsible. The living entities are engaged in their respective activities of sense gratification and these activities are not ordained by the Lord. For advancement of sense gratification, the living entities are engaged in the work of this world and they aspire to heavenly happiness after death. The Lord being full in himself has no attraction for so-called heavenly happiness. The heavenly demigods are only his engaged servants. The proprietor, never desires the low-grade happiness such as the workers may desire. He is therefore aloof. He is aloof from the material actions and reactions. For example, the rains are not responsible for different types of vegetation that appear on the earth. Although without such rains, there is no possibility of vegetative growth. Vedic Smriti confers, confirms this fact as follows. Nimitta matran eva so, srityanam sarga karmani, pradana karani bhuta, yatovai sritya shaktayaha. Quote, in the material creations, the Lord is only the supreme cause. The immediate cause is material nature, by which the cosmic manifestation is made visible. The created beings are of many varieties, such as the demigods, human beings, and lower animals. And all of them are subject to the reactions of their past good or bad activities. The Lord only gives them the proper facilities for such activities and the regulations of the modes of nature but he is never responsible for their past and present activities. In the Vedanta Sutra 2.1.34, it is confirmed by Shamya Nairgrinena Sapeksha Tvat. The Lord is never partial to any living entity. The living entity is responsible for his own acts. The Lord only gives him facilities through the agency of material nature, the external energy. Anyone who is fully conversant with all the intricacies of this law of karma or fruitive activities does not become affected by the results of his activities. In other words, the person who understands this transcendental nature of the Lord is an experienced man in Krishna consciousness and thus he is never subjected to the laws of karma. One who does not know the transcendental nature of the Lord and who thinks that the activities of the Lord are aimed at fruitive results, as are the activities of the ordinary living entities, certainly becomes entangled himself in fruitive reactions. But one who knows the supreme truth is a liberated soul, fixed in Krishna consciousness. So I'm going to chant the Mangala Charan for auspiciousness. 
Om Jnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurum Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavangscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunatam Vitam Tvam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Jaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitamsha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Chagatpate Gopesha Gop Pika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Rade Vrindavaneshwari Brishabanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubyasha Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Patitanam Pavanebio Vaishnavibio Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Jaitanya Prabhunitananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shivasadi Gauravakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare Namam Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimate Bhaktivedanta Swami Nitinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatyade Shatarine Hare Krishna. So I want to thank you again for allowing me to say something about Bhagavad Gita. And before I start, I want to apologize that I'm not wearing any tilak today and the reason is i'm at the moment outside of the temple china thai prabhu knows in the temple where i'm usually staying in zurich we're having some uh, problems with some some kind of bug it's called scabies and many devotees are affected and since i don't have any problems i have to stay away from the temple which means I'm outside of the temple for many weeks now. And unfortunately, I don't have a tilak with me. And I'm sorry. Normally, we do have a tilak, when we, especially when we give lecture. Actually, Prabhupada wanted us to have always tilak. So I, I apologize for that. But I put some water tilak, which you cannot see, unfortunately, but it's there. So when I was reading this text and this purport, I could see that in the first part of the purport, Prabhupada is using a analogy like he does very often in order to um, make us understand something which is a little bit far away from our consciousness, from our um, experience to make it more easy to grasp what is discussed and the first analogy is using is that of the king it's a very common and famous analogy of course the king being um, compared to Sri Krishna and I have to tell you honestly when I was reading about King, I was immediately thinking about what's going on right now, yeah, especially in the US. I don't know how many of you are sometimes reading newspaper or watching news. Somehow or other, sometimes I do read the newspaper, especially because at the moment there are many uh, 
issues which we all can feel in our daily life one of course being the coronavirus and then just recently we had some um, terror attacks in vienna and also in france and now these elections in the us of course which are quite uh, dramatic so i was tempted to drift a little bit off to be honest and i so I wanted to talk about uh, the monarchy, which Prabhupada here talks about, just shortly to make this point about law being compared to karma. But then, f fortunately, I was listening to a lecture of Prabhupada, and he gave me some other inspiration, and I thought, let us talk about this today. And of course, just to maybe say a few words, what is, what is going on right now, and also how we as devotees um, should try to deal with these things. Here in this verse, we speak or we hear from Krishna about activities. He's actually using the word karma three times, of course, in different ways. And this topic of action, as we learn in the introduction of the Bhagavad Gita by Srila Prabhupada, is one of the five main topics which are being explained in the Bhagavad Gita. These are being Ishvara, God, Jiva, the living entity, karma, action, kala, time, and prakriti, nature. So we can understand that if we have five main topics, this topic of activity is a very important one to understand. And we can see that in the world, everybody's acting and we see in ourselves, we are acting in a certain way and other people act in a certain way and nobody can be inactive at any time. And then when we see or hear from scripture that when God comes, he also acts and it seems he acts in the same way like the conditioned living entities do. And that can be quite confusing. Actually, sometimes Krishna even acts in a way which seems to be immoral. That's what Prabhupada actually talks about in his lecture. And I just tell you, in, if you are interested to go and listen to it, maybe later, this lecture has been given on August the 6th, 1974. So you can look it up online. And so Krishna himself, he explains that his activities, they are not material. And he then grants or gives the boon that one who understands the nature of his activities and in this particular words that these activities are not because he wants to enjoy something material and also that he's not forced to do this person who understands he becomes free from his own reactions when he acts and that's not the only time krishna is giving this um, promise that we, when we understand this, we can, uh, we, you know, we, we have a spiritual benefit from it. But just a few verses before, I just have to scroll back. 
for a moment. There is this very famous verse where Krishna says, Janma karma chame divyam evangya veti tattvataha takta deham punar janma naiti mam eti sorjuna. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode or juna. I guess many of you have heard this verse before. It's a very famous one. And also in this verse, Krishna is promising that when somebody understands the nature of his activities, he will be qualified to go back to the spiritual world. So we can see how important it is to understand Krishna's person, which includes all his qualities and his activities. And I wanted to read to you one verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, which is very famous and which glorifies the activities of Krishna. And this verse, or it's actually a song, it's called Gopi Gita, means the song of the gopis, the cowherd girls, was very dear to my spiritual master, His Holiness Bhakti Charu Swami Maharaj, who just left a few months ago, his body. And he used to sing it very often. And I'm just quote to you this one verse, which is the most prominent. This is from Srimad Bhagavatam 10th Canto, 31st chapter, text number 9. Tavakatam ritam tapta jivanam kaviviriditam kalma shapaham shravana mangalam srimadatatam puvigrinanti yeburi dajana. Translation, the nectar of your words and the descriptions of your activities are the life and soul of those suffering in this material world. These narrations transmitted by learned sages eradicate one's sinful reactions and bestow good fortune upon whoever hears them. These narrations are broadcast all over the world and are filled with spiritual power. Certainly those who spread the message of Godhead are most munificent. So here we hear another perspective about the nature of the activities of Krishna, which I want to focus on today. Like Krishna has said in the Bhagavad Gita that he, his activities, they are not polluted by material nature. So it means they don't have anything negative about them. When we look at our activities, they are very affected by the <clears throat> material nature. It is described in the Bhagavad Gita that all the activities of the conditioned living entities, they are performed due to the three modes of material nature. And these activities are always based on a sense of false ego. It means every living entity acts in order to enjoy selfishly. The jiva comes into this material world and it gets a material body which comprises of mind, intelligence, false ego, and which also has senses namely the five knowledge acquiring senses and the five working senses. And with this body, the living entity is not do, does nothing else but enjoy. Tries to enjoy the different 
element in the world. And that's why when we see or hear about such kind of activities, it is actually very inauspicious. Because they are polluted by material nature, by material consciousness. If we just hear about such kind of activities, we degrade ourselves. And this I want to mention in relation to what I've said in the beginning that at the time we are in now, we hear a lot in the news and in the TV and on the internet about what's going on in this world. And we hear about what people do. And there is a lot of argument. And it has some fascination for the conditioned soul to hear about it. But we have to understand as devotees that it, we don't have any benefit hearing about it. But like we have heard in this verse, we should hear about Krishna's activities and his, his qualities. Here it is mentioned specifically that these narrations transmitted by learned sages eradicate one's sinful reactions and bestow good fortune upon whoever hears them. And Prabhupada in this lecture about this particular verse, he said that Krishna, he's just like the sun. He gives another analogy. And like the sun, we can see it shines everywhere. Its light goes everywhere. And even in this world, when we see there is some urine or there is some stool, if the sun shines there, the place gets purified. And the sun doesn't get contaminated by the urine or the stool. Everything else which would get in contact, like if we would touch stool, if we would touch urine, we would become contaminated. Actually, they said even by just thinking of stool, we would become contaminated. <laughs> but Prabhupada explains that Krishna is so pure that he purifies everything. And that's what happens if somebody hears about the qualities, the activities, or the names of Krishna. We get purified. And in another verse in Srimad Bhagavatam Prabhupada, he says that this is the only remedy for the human civilization to attain good fortune. And we can understand just by reading this one verse. And that's why I know this verse was very dear to His Holiness Bhakti Charu Maharaj, and it was very dear to Lord Chaitanya as well. Because in this verse, the gopis, can you imagine the gopis who are the top most devotees? There is no devotee like the, like the gopis who have so much intense love for Krishna. And what do they do? They glorify those people who spread the message about Krishna in the world. Means who broadcast the Srimad Bhagavatam, who spread the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. And we all know that Srila Prabhupada, he was one of these great personalities. He did something which no, nobody else did in history. He spread the news about Krishna, the message about Krishna in the whole world. It means in the whole world, everybody has access to Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. 
And so that's what I wanted to mention, especially today, where we see the world is in a situation of extreme conflict that we as devotees, we are actually forced to take shelter of Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, Chaitanya Charitamrita, these transcendental narrations. Because if even we as devotees, we start to divert our attention to the material sound vibration, then what hope is there in the civilization? And we also hear in the nectar of instruction that of all the inauspicious things, Rupa Goswami, he summarized the most inauspicious things which we should avoid in order to cultivate our bhakti properly. And <clears throat> he mentioned there in a verse, Atyahara Priyasascha Prajalpo Niyamagraha Janasangas Chaloliamcha Shatpir Bhakti Vinashit. I think that's the last line. I'm not sure if it's the later verse. But he's mentioning prajalpa, means words about mundane subject matters. And also he's mentioning jana sangar, associationally with worldly minded people. So that's what happens if we listen to the news too much when we uh, hear news on the internet or we watch videos on YouTube, for example. If we hear about these kind of topics from people who are not in Krishna consciousness, we degrade ourselves and our bhakti doesn't grow properly. It's actually very, very detrimental to our bhakti if we hear too much about these kind of things. So we should avoid that and instead we should hear about Krishna. And it's a very, very fortunate thing that we just came into the Kartik Dharmadharmas, where we very specifically make an endeavor to hear about the activities of Krishna. And when I was reflecting about the song Dhamma before coming into this class, I was struck how direct we can hear about Krishna in this song. It's simply Leela, which is narrated in this song. And by taking this month and this vow where we sing this song every day, at least once, and we meditate about the meaning, we actually will reach our goal, what Krishna is saying in this verse, that if we understand the activities of him, then we will attain liberation and we can go back home, back to Godhead. And so in this song, Dhamdarastakam, we also uh, find out why Krishna is acting. Because here we hear in this verse that I, sorry, I have only my Kindle with me, so I have to take some time sometimes to scroll. But in the verse we have narrated today, the 14th verse, Krishna says, 
Name Karma Fale Spriha, that Krishna is not having any desire for a result when he acts. But then we see how Krishna is acting so much. <coughs> the whole uh, tenth canto is full of narrations about activities of the Lord. And so we should understand that if Krishna is not acting in order to get a result, in order to enjoy, why is he acting? And in the song Damdarashtakam, there is a line or a term which says Bhakti Badam, that Krishna is bound by devotion. And just because of the devotion of his devotees, Krishna starts to act in all kinds of wonderful ways. Like in this Damodarashtakam or in this Damodaralila, we hear how the Supreme Lord, who is the who is called Bhagavan, he is full of all kinds of opulences, and he's Atmaram, he's completely satisfied within himself. He runs away from Jashodamai, and he's crying. And then he even lets, he let her bind him around the grinding mortar. And it seems like that he's also bound by the laws of karma, that he's just a young, small boy. And like every young boy, he's forced to act according to the will of his mother. Like when I remember my childhood and the childhood of my uh, sisters, for example, we were forced to act according to the will of our mother and our father. But Krishna is also, what is the difference? He's, he's even getting bound with a rope. Uh, this never happened to me, for example. So it seems that he's even worse, that he's even more under control of, by his mother. But it's the complete opposite. He's, he's not bound by karmic reaction, but he's bound by love. And he's in the same way helpless, like we are in this material world to the karmic loss, he's helpless to the love of the devotees. And because all his narrations, all his leelas, they are only filled with pure devotion, they are purifying. And that's why we should hear them as it is explained by the gopis in Srimad Bhagavatam. Because there is no tinge of enjoying spirit, either of the side from the devotees or from the side of Krishna himself. But they both just want to please each other. So we have quite some days left where we can meditate about this Leela and hear and chant about it. And just because we do it every day doesn't mean that we, we, it will lose its benefit or it will get boring, no. Um, the narrations of Krishna are always fresh and always enjoyable for his devotees. So we can go deeper and deeper by chanting this prayer every day, every day for the month of Kartik. So I think I will stop here. And if maybe I would like to ask Chani Thai Prabhu, if you would like to say something or Karuna Shakti Prabhu, if you want to say something, please feel free.
And otherwise, if somebody has any questions, we can also try to say something more. So if you have any questions, just feel free to unmute yourselves by clicking the microphone icon in the bottom left corner. And I can see there is a question um, by Schumit. He writes, I mean, we, we can, I, I'll, uh, I can see there are some more people who have unmuted themselves, but I'll just, uh, I'll just read the the message from the chat and we can maybe deal with that later after the questions because it's not directly related. It says, Hare Krishna Prabhu, please accept my humble obeisances. I would like to request you to share some pastimes of His Holiness Bhakti Charu Swami Maharaj. So maybe we can do that later after the questions. Uh, if there are questions, I can see that Martin has already unmuted himself. I think he has a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hare Krishna, Damodha Prasad. Nice to see you. Nice to see that you are well. And um, yeah, actually, I, I had a situation um, last week. I met with my grandparents, and um, it was funny because uh, they also asked me if I am if I'm watching news, um, and then I said no, I don't. Um, and then, uh, like my my grandfather, kind of uh, w wanted to argue with me, and said something like, um, "If you don't look news, you are not really in the moment." So, um, if you had to give him an answer, what would you say? You have to unmute yourself, Damodar Prasad Prabhu. Sorry, Prabhu. I'm actually not so experienced. It's my first Zoom lecture whatsoever. So forgive me for my um, inexperience. So Martin, you were saying that, how would you answer to your grandfather who says, if you don't listen to the news, you're not living in the moment. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Oh, you have always good questions for me. I, I mean, have, yeah, Charlie type Prabhu? I have a good answer. Yeah, can, please go ahead. But if you don't listen to Krishna's pastimes, then <laughs> you're missing the eternity or not only this moment, but all the moments and eternity. And anyway, just sorry for for interrupting, it was just an idea I had. Nice. Yeah, so, you know, I don't, pro I probably don't have a good answer because I myself am listening to the news sometimes. So, you know, if I, You're unmuted you're, again. You're muted again, yeah. It wouldn't be honest if I would say that I don't um, listen to the news and that now I have to defend myself in front of somebody. But maybe uh, Karuna Shakti Prabhu, Karuna Shakti Prabhu, right? Maybe he would like to say something. Because, yeah, you are also much more senior than me. You must no, know. I'm not senior to you. But anyway, I, I don't know if I'm the right person because as we're speaking, you might not know my computer setup, but I have two screens and one screen is the Zoom call. The other one at the moment has a, a news site open. It's, uh, yeah, anyway, it depends. News per se are not necessarily bad. I mean, if, if you're watching the weather forecast, it, it can be useful um, to know, you know, what's, what kind of weather is there, what kind of, uh, maybe if, if there is a typhoon or hurricane or something coming, what kind of uh, evacuation uh, is going on or something like that. There are things that concern us directly in our everyday lives. So that may be very interesting or very useful to know 
But yeah, then there are other news like, yeah, if you look at some newspapers, then you can like meditate on what is actually useful and then you will find out it's just like in a supermarket, 95, 98% of products that you can buy in a supermarket are practically useless for most people. I mean, I'm not buying diapers or, or <laughs> some kind of, I don't know, uh, eggs or something. That Those things are use, useless for me, but there are some useful things. So, yeah, keep it practical. If, if, you need, if you think you need some news or you want to know something, like what are the current visa restrictions for India and when will they be lifted or something like that, that can be useful but other things might not be useful for your, for your life. It also depends if you have a saver or a job or something, then you might be required to watch or to, to, to follow certain news. Um, yeah, that's just what I would say. I mean, we, we, we should not be too fanatical and say we are completely in a different world because we, we still move around in this world. And uh, I, I remember, in, in during these times, during these Corona times, I was uh, in India this spring and I was following the news because it did directly concern me because yeah. of the visa restrictions. I was there on like two days or no, actually the last, my last day in India was the day when they announced that they would uh, suspend all tourist visas and I could not return to India for, yeah, until now I, I have not been able to return to India, although I have a five year visa because I left and that meant I was uh, no longer eligible to return with that visa because the visa until today is suspended. So that is useful news that was very practical at that moment. But uh, for example, if uh, you, you follow the local election somewhere in, in, in a distant country that you don't have any connection to, that is practically useless for you. Mm. Just, just my personal view. I, I know I'm not very credible with that because I do follow a lot of useless news, but there are some useful news that may be necessary to follow. Maybe Martin, I also have a small point that if you analyze the news, you can see, I just want to see you, you can see that mostly they talk about things that had happened and things that will happen. So basically the mind of the one who consumes news is, con is by getting in touch with the news constantly directed towards the past and the future. If we look back, they criticize and they lament, lament over things that have happened. Sometimes they even feel happy, you know, if a football team wins or something and they're happy. And then in the future, they, for like now in the Corona, they already, you know, make some prognosis, how things will get worse. So you fear about the future or sometimes they also predict something nice, then you look forward. So how much are you in the moment if you get in touch with the news? That would be maybe a question I would ask your grandfather about this specific comment he made. How much does the news connect you to the moment actually? Martin, you want to say something? Yeah, uh, to be honest, I in that situation, I felt like kind of, I really had the feeling that he's kind of um, getting in a challenge, challenging mood. <laughs> like, yeah, he, he was like, or, uh, I, or maybe also because I feel, felt challenged. And then I, I was just thinking, now uh, maybe I don't, uh, don't go, uh, go into it because, um, yeah, I don't want to like have talks in this kind of spirit because I really um, make the experience that it's not so not a nice basis to exchange knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would, uh, would like Actually, to... I like your point because 
he's your grandfather and if he's not asking you particularly for your opinion then it's maybe good to just be humble and tolerate whatever he says and this will impress him more yeah. you know if you just if you just take a humble position <laughs> nice So then we're done. Someone or? else has a question, they can ask the question. Otherwise, we still have that uh, un unfulfilled request by Shumit if you could share a pastime of Bhakti Charu Swami with us. Should, should we do that? Why not? I mean, we, we still have time, and people have not yet asked any further question. So, and you are the right person to to fulfill that request. Okay. Hare Krishna Shumit Prabhu. Hare Krishna. You're from Bangladesh? Okay. Kemanachin Prabhu. Malo. Okay, so um yeah I've spent some time with my spiritual master. And I want to maybe tell you one story, which I always keep in the forefront of my mind. That was when I started to travel with him. And it was the first flight I was having where I was sitting right next to him. It means I was sitting here and he was sitting on the right side next to the window and so I was quite nervous obviously being so close to the pure devotee and so when the plane left off uh, just after a few minutes he turned to me and he asked me straight why did I choose him as, his, as my spiritual master and I wasn't initiated at the time. I took shelter maybe a few months back. And so I was really shocked by this question because, yeah, I, I, I mean, I had to give him, I had to say something. So I look back when I first met him and I remember how uh, inspired I was just by being in his presence. I still remember. So I told him that I could see um, I, uh, that he was a very advanced devotee and I could feel his purity and I was attracted to him and serve him. I said a few things to this extent. And like if you're having a conversation, you know, you're always looking for a reaction in the other person to see if you're saying is good or not good. So he was just looking at me and he was kind of emotionless, just looking at me. So I became nervous, you know, I was like, oh my God, it seems like I'm not saying the right thing. Maybe he's not happy with my reply. So then I immediately thought, you know, what else, what else? And I told him that actually I could see that he was um, very much connected with Srila Prabhupada. And when I just said this one sentence, he's, he started to like explode. And he said, yes, that is the point. That's important. And he said, you know, I am just who I am. But Srila Prabhupada is Srila Prabhupada. And he said, it is like in Christianity that Jesus Christ is considered the founder of the Christian faith. And even though many other preachers came after Jesus, 
Jesus Christ will always be Jesus Christ. And similar in ISKCON, there might be many, you know, gurus and preachers, but Srila Prabhupada will always be Srila Prabhupada. And then he told me very emphatically, so you develop your relationship with Srila Prabhupada like I did. And I always keep that in mind because it's a very, very profound uh, instruction. And of course, I was meditating about it because he spent um, almost a year with Srila Prabhupada personally. And I was always wondering, how can I develop a relationship with Srila Prabhupada the way he did? It's impossible. But... We know that Srila Prabhupada is in his books, in his lectures. So I hope that's satisfying. Past time. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru. Thank you so much. So last call, are there any questions from the audience? You can just unmute yourselves and say something. I think. Hare Krishna Prabhu, um, I would like to um, ask a small question or hear your thoughts about it. Um, isn't religion or is religious activities, are they supposed to, um, aren't they supposed to strengthen our values and beliefs so much that we do not have problems, uh, like we don't deviate from our faith when we go in the outside world? Because I somehow um, get the feeling like when I hear that we should not, um, if that our beliefs can um, distort if we talk to the people who are not so much into Krishna consciousness or um, or something similar. So I somehow have a feeling that we should kind of save ourselves, so to say, from the outside world. But on the other hand, I also feel like um, our knowledge which, which we gain, that should help us more towards strengthening our beliefs. So where am I um, thinking wrong or what do you think about um, Hare Krishna Prabhu. I cannot see you and I don't see your name. What is the name, Prabhu? My name is Keshav. I'll just switch on my camera. Just a second. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Thank you for your question. It's a very good question. I find because when speaking about the topic of avoiding material associ or association with non-devotees, I find it's important to be careful not to be imbalanced because then it can look that we are very fanatic and we just try to exclude ourselves from society. So, you, and you are right, right, Prabhupada, he actually wanted us to be in society and share the knowledge. So, what you mentioned in the beginning, I think is true that the goal is that our faith becomes so strong that uh, we can go anywhere and we will not be affected, but the Ekya uh, Kurunandana, we are situated in proper intelligence, uh, knowing what we want and what we don't want. However, we also learn from the scriptures and uh, teachers that there are different stages of devotees. And basically, you can group them into three. Kanishta, the neophyte, Madhyam, the intermediate, and uh, Uttama Adhikari, who is the pure devotee. And 
the Uttama Dikari, he can go wherever he wants. He's not affected. Because he can see Krishna everywhere. Then the Madhyama Dikari, then the Kanishta Dikari, he thinks he's the only devotee and everybody else is a non-devotee. And then there's the Madhyama Dikari. He actually makes a distinction. And there is a verse which comes to my mind um, in Srimad Bhagavatam. I forgot the number, but there it is said that the Madhya Madhikari makes a distinction between four kinds of people. First of all, there is God, Krishna. And God, with God, he deals in prema, bhakti, love. Then, he sees the devotee and with the devotee he makes friendship and then with the non-devotees he divides them into two kinds of people one the innocent people those who just don't know about krishna but who are in nature not inimical and then it is said he treats them like with mercy and compassionate he tries to help uplift them in consciousness. And then there is the other group of devote, uh, non-devotees. And these are the envious ones. They openly say that uh, Krishna doesn't exist, God doesn't exist, etc. And these people, the Madhya Madhikari, he avoids. So this is very helpful to know that uh, Prabhupada says in this uh, verse that we are Kanishta Dikaris mostly, but we try to come to the level of Madhyam. So we want to act in this way. And we just, we use our intelligence and we discriminate between people. And then one more thing which comes to my mind. Um, when we associate with non-devotees, First of all, what we just said, the envious, we don't really try to mingle with them. If we can, we just avoid. But if we see somebody is open, we can associate with them. But then there is one more point, and Prabhupada, he actually tells a story. And I don't want to tell the story because it goes too long, but the story illustrates that if you have association with someone, you can... Always decide if you want to give your heart and kind of expose yourself or you protect yourself. And that was the point Prabhupada made that if we associate with them, we give them knowledge and we give them Krishna consciousness, prasadam, books, or we talk to them about these things, but we don't open our heart to them means we don't go and tell them our problems or want to have an intimate connection. So, and in this way, we can use our intelligence and navigate ourselves wherever we are. We can, we can go wherever we want. We just have to follow these instructions. Does that help? Yeah, it surely does. I mean, I did, did understand how it was meant and how I should think about it. Hare Krishna, thank you. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Okay. So I think we came to an end, Prabhu. Yes, we can. I think if there's no other question, then we can conclude this evening uh, by saying thank you to Zantak and uh, grazie to all, tho all those of you who have joined us and we have, uh, I think, reached the point where we can say we are hoi uh, gache, as we say in Bengali, uh, to continue your little Bengali lesson here. Uh, and uh, thank you, Damodar Prasad Prabhu, for speaking to us, for answering those questions in this very interactive way. We hope that we can have you with us very soon uh, and hear from another verse or hear about another verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, it was very nice to have you with us and uh, 
Thank you also, Iskon Oslo, for joining us, for being with us. And thanks to all of you. And I wish you a good night. Stay safe and uh, remain healthy. Uh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much.